Crazy Sex Life of Spartacus Spartacus was a Thracian gladiator who became one of the leaders of the escaped slaves during the Third Civil War, a major uprising against the Roman Republic. Little is known about him beyond the events of the war, and surviving historical accounts are sometimes contradictory. However, all sources agree that he was a former gladiator and an accomplished military leader. Shura was Spartacus's wife, the most important person in his life, for whom he would do anything. Despite her usually wearing only a set of simple calmer clothes, Cheryl was still an extremely beautiful woman with a shapely body and long wavy dark brown hair. Her beauty was such that she caught the eye of Spartacus during his days as a womanizer in Thrace. He met Shura and became enamored with her, and she reciprocated his feelings. Embedded with her when they had finished, Spartacus told her to stay because if not, his heart would break. Though Shura replied that she could not stay, she gave her name. He tried to do the same, but she stalked him because all women knew who he was, including herself. Shura also mentioned that the gods led her to his bed. When Spartacus asked what more she knew about him, Shura replied that he would never love another woman. From that moment on, they fell in love and became husband and wife. Spartacus and Shura's Chaotic Relationship Spartacus then had to go to war against the gate, but his wife Shura asked him not to, as she had a dream in which he was in front of a red serpent, taking it as a warning of great and unfortunate things. Spartacus reassured her, but still went to battle. When Legatist Labor betrayed the Thracians, he became the principal leader of the insubordination. Afterward, he returned to his village, which had been destroyed by the savages, but he managed to find Shura and escape. Unfortunately, Labor found him and sentenced him to die at Gladium, with Shura condemned to slavery. In his death sentence, Spartacus was to die in the arena, fighting against gladiators. However, when he was about to face three others, three additional gladiators appeared, and Spartacus had to fight all four of them. When he was on the brink of death, he remembered Shura's words before he went to war, and he killed all four gladiators in a rage. The crowd demanded his life, but Glaber managed to enslave him as a gladiator for Batiatus. Even while enslaved, Spartacus stated that he would do whatever he needed to do to see Shura back in his arms. He made a deal with Batiatus that if he proved capable in the arena, Batiatus would find and return Shura to him. Spartacus finally proved himself by defeating Theocles and becoming the champion of Capua. Shura was returned to him, but Spartacus did not want to see his wife as a slave. He began to plan for both of them to be free or die in the attempt. Spartacus's wife was an amazing priestess and prophetess. We don't know a great deal about Spartacus's real-life wife, but the facts we do have indicate she was a formidable lady. Although later fictional versions have dubbed her Varinia, we don't even know her real name. The ancients left that part out of their histories. Our big source for her is Plutarch. His wife, from the same Thracian tribe as her husband, was also a priestess of Dionys and a prophetess. She became possessed by the god and foretold that Spartacus would have a great and terrible power which would end in misfortune. Spartacus's fight against slavery inspired later heroes. In the 18th century, Toussaint Louverture fought the French to free what would later become Haiti from its imperial overlords as well as to abolish slavery. A truly inspirational figure then and now who defeated his French enemies to declare freedom, Louverture sadly died in French captivity, but his legacy lives on, he was also dubbed the Black Spartacus. It is said that when he was first brought to Rome to be sold, a serpent was seen coiled about his face as he slept, and his wife, who was of the same tribe as Spartacus, a prophetess, and subject to visitations of the Dionysiac frenzy declared it the sign of a great and formidable power which would attend him to a fortunate issue. This woman shared in his escape and was then living with him. If it seems odd that a gladiator had a wife, it shouldn't. Roman slaves often had wives, and children too, although such marriages were not valid in Roman law. Spartacus's wife was religious, vocal, and hardy enough to endure the life of an escaped slave battling the Roman army. As a Thracian woman she probably had tattooed arms. 
As a worshipper of Dionys, she was used to rural places, especially mountainsides. Another thing about the cult of Dionys, she probably handled snakes, the god's symbol. Dionys was the god not only of wine but also of liberation. Various peoples considered him their national god, from Thracians to Greeks in southern Italy. Several enemies of Rome chose Dionys as their rallying cry, including rebel slaves in 2nd century BC Sicily and the Anatolian king Mithridates of Pontus, whose long war against Rome was still on at the outbreak of Spartacus's revolt in 73 BC. Hence, Dionys made a good symbol for Spartacus. Thracians valued the religious authority of women and they set great store by prophecy, making it likely that Spartacus's wife was a respected figure. Slave owners may well have feared her, having learned from the Sicilian rebellions that prophets and witches were troublemakers. As for the story of a snake coiled around Spartacus's face, herpetologists discount the possibility, but that may be why it seemed like a miracle at the time. Imagine Spartacus's wife announcing, perhaps after a vision in a trance that Dionys had sent a snake as a sign of Spartacus's great power. Did she actually inspire Spartacus's revolt? To say that would be going beyond the evidence, but she certainly added to his mystique. In short, behind the macho figure of Spartacus, there was a woman. We do not know what happened to the Thracian woman, but she probably shared the same unhappy fate as most of Spartacus's followers. Sure as death messed up the intimate life of Spartacus. When she finally arrived, Spartacus found the man dragging the cart wounded and saying that they were attacked. He opened the cart and saw Shura nearly dead. He grabbed her, and they shared a final moment together as she died in his arms, much to his grief. Myra was a house slave in Batiatus's villa, tasked with sleeping with him. Spartacus refused her numerous times, allowing her to stay in his quarters. She repaid Spartacus for saving her by finding Vero's family, which allowed Pharaoh to reconcile. This act earned Myra some of Spartacus's trust. When Spartacus found Myra being attacked by Hector, he immediately stepped in and defended her, causing her to develop some affection towards him. The next night, Myra thanked Spartacus for his actions, but he shrugged off her gratitude, stating he would have done the same for anyone. Despite this, Myra showed interest in Spartacus's fight with Vero, expressing concern for him after he was forced to kill Vero. She met him in his cell and held the crying Spartacus in his time of grief. When Spartacus fell ill in the wake of Vero's death, Bodiadis noted Spartacus's feelings for Myra and ordered her to help nurse him back to health. Spartacus allowed her to have a private talk with him, and she expressed anger at him when he was not willing to let her touch him after what she'd done for him. Spartacus stopped Myra from leaving and told her that he was just conflicted. She sat down to talk with him and voiced his thoughts. She was horrified that he would let all the slaves die to seek vengeance on Batiatus after learning that Batiatus ordered his wife's death. It was not until he began to formulate his plan for vengeance that the two developed a relationship. The night before the plan, Myra promised to aid him under the condition that he would make love to her instead of just intimacy, wanting to know the love he felt for his wife. Spartacus agreed to this condition, and the two made love. After the breakout, the two entered into a relationship. Myra remained loyal to Spartacus and a truthful advisor, bonded by love. Spartacus held her close to his heart with this affection, and she dedicated herself to him and the cause. Until she was struck down by Salvius before the Battle of Vesuvius, Spartacus was truly devastated by her death. He attacked Nimitz for his reckless actions that indirectly led to Myra's murder. He wrapped Myra's body in his cloak and fastened it with vines. It was the death of his lover that inspired him to make ropes made of vines to scale the mountain and blindside Glaber's army. During the battle against Labor and his forces, Spartacus would vatax Salvius for killing Myra, brutally slamming his face into a pillar until he died. With this act, Spartacus avenged Myra's death. Spartacus and Leda. Spartacus first met Leda while looking for grain in Sinuessa. Leda was a kind and compassionate woman who did not look down upon slaves and even treated them well, unlike many other Romans. 
however, she disapproved of the rebels and their treatment of Roman captives. Leader, intelligent, young, beautiful, and as independent as a Roman woman was allowed to be, was married to her husband, Adele Aeneas, with whom she lived happily. They made a comfortable living in the city of Sinuessa. Born and raised in a wealthy home, Leda had only known life as a privileged Roman aristocrat, but she was a kind person who did not mistreat her slaves. When the rebels attacked the city, Leda questioned why Spartacus had sided with them, only to realize that he was Spartacus himself. Spartacus killed her husband in front of her before imprisoning her, though he gave her more freedom among the hostages. When Crixus led the rebels in the slaughter of the prisoners, Spartacus intervened and gave her mercy. Later, she was somewhat taken aback when urged to kill her by Crixus, but he refused and placed her and the remaining hostages in his villa for protection. Spartacus eventually released her and the prisoners as part of a plan to trick Crassus, allowing the Romans to leave the city. However, when Crassus took the city, he condemned Leda to slavery. She escaped with Gannicus and Sibyl, albeit wounded. Spartacus was reunited with Leda and tended to her wounds. In Moore's Interceptor, Leda meets briefly with Spartacus in the Medicus tent, describing her loss of faith caused by the brand that Heraclio burned into her forearm. Spartacus tried to counsel her loss, saying that there is no single simple answer, and each person must find their own way past it. Spartacus and Leda met again at the height of the storm, where she shared her blanket with him, expressing her desire for him to live. Leda was told by Agron that Spartacus held affections for her, which surprised her and left her speechless. During a private talk, they bickered in a joking manner, and Spartacus noticed that her wounds had healed, and she was back to her old self. He told her to rejoin the party, but Leda pulled him back, wanting his company before they kissed passionately. Spartacus then told Leda that, because she was Roman, he couldn't give her his heart. Undeterred, she replied that it wasn't his heart she was after, but something else. The two then proceeded to make passionate love on the floor, officially becoming lovers after this encounter. Spartacus was sold as a slave and became a gladiator. After turning on his purported former employers, the Roman army, Sparty was captured and sold as a slave. Where? To a school that trained gladiators for combat in the arena, located in Capua, near modern Naples, owned by one Nias Lentulus Batiatus. There, Spartacus got super buff and befriended a couple of guys named Crixus and Enomors. These relationships would serve him well in the future. And the friendships he cultivated weren't the only things that boded well for his future feats. According to Plutarch, Spartacus's wife Air Prophetess E saw Sparty sleeping with a snake on his face shortly after his capture in Rome. His wife declared this unlikely scenario the sign of a great and terrifying force which would attend him to an issue. Certainly, a great and terrifying force is a phrase that can be used to describe the revolts that Spartacus would incite against Rome. In 73 BCE, fed up with being a slave, Spartacus and 78 of his pals fled the gladiator school. Their only weapons? Supposedly, they were limited to kitchen knives and spits at first, then they acquired a cache of gladiators' swords, tridents, etc. They fled Capua to the slopes of Mount Vesuvius, which would become best known 150 years later for exploding and coating Pompeii. Over time, Spartacus rallied more slaves to his side. He became not only a symbol of freedom, but also of Rome's corrupt political system. Spartacus beat several Roman armies. In the two years after his initial escape and flight to Vesuvius, Spartacus's army swelled to include almost 90,000 disaffected slaves from all over Italy. During this time, Rome sent several military forces to defeat Spartacus, Spartacus beat them all. First up was Praetor Claudius Glaber, who probably didn't think much of the rebel forces, regarding them more as disorganized no accounts than an army, Spartacus and company were besieged on a vine-covered hill, but they escaped by climbing down the vines, and they defeated Glaber. Next up against Spartacus was another Praetor, Publius Varinius, they'd already beaten his legate, Varinius split his forces and lost the battle. 
Spartacus captured him and paraded him naked through camp. The final campaign before the end was a giant consular force, Spartacus had become quite formidable by this point, and his army had learned to make its own weapons. Two consuls went up against Spartacus, who squashed both their armies. After defeating the Roman consular armies, Spartacus headed north. Why? The south was controlled by his enemies, Rome, so he couldn't sail from there, but by pulling a Hannibal and crossing the Alps, he might be home free. And not just Sparty himself, he planned to disperse his army, and all slaves would be on their own, to get home as best they could. But rather than trek north, Spartacus's soldiers, hyped up because of their many victories, were into getting rich and pillaged the land around them, wasting time wreaking havoc through Italy. Since his Alps plan didn't work out, Spartacus tried to get to the Italian coast so he and his men could sail away. He seized a southern town in the hopes of providing a safe haven to sail to Sicily, an island full of disaffected slaves. In pursuit of a home base on Sicily, Spartacus made a deal with the devil Eeyore Devils. He forged an alliance with Cilician pirates, groups of sea bandits from Asia Minor who'd ravaged the Mediterranean coastline for decades. They wanted to establish a base on Sicily so they could plunder Italy itself. The pirates could, in turn, help Spartacus sail into the sunset. Sparty got to the Strait of Messina around 71 BCE, but all wasn't as it seemed. In fact, the Sicilian sailors didn't show up to ferry the army across to Sicily as they'd promised. Something had gone horribly, horribly wrong. The pirates might have been bought off by the Romans or just given up. It took Rome's richest citizen and a thousand men to beat Spartacus. Once the pirates betrayed him, Spartacus was confronted by one Marcus Licinius Crassus, Rome's richest man and an important political figure. Crassus brought eight legions and even executed every tenth man in two of the units who'd been previously defeated by Spartacus. Why? In order to indicate that another defeat wouldn't be tolerated. Spartacus knew Crassus meant business, so he offered to make a peace treaty with the Roman, which Crassus rejected. To inspire his own troops, Spartacus crucified a Roman soldier in front of them. After barely escaping some of Crassus's traps and losing some men to a rebellion, Spartacus faced off with Crassus in 71 BCE. Ultimately, Roman troops overwhelmed Spartacus's soldiers, especially his key cavalry. Spartacus himself perished in the battle. After the ultimate battle between Spartacus and Crassus ended badly for the former, Crassus decided to make an example of the rebels, so that Rome's slaves, who drove born in Thrace, an ancient land made up of chunks of modern southeastern Europe, Spartacus might have been a soldier in his youth. The historian Appian wrote that Spartacus had once served as a soldier with the Romans. He was a paid auxiliary before allegedly turning on his former employers, some ancient sources dubbed him a traitor, bandit, and deserter. The imperial economy it would learn a lesson. To accomplish this, he crucified 6,000 of Spartacus's soldiers along the Appian Way between Capua and Rome. Unlike the Spartacus film, the already dead Spartacus himself was not among those crucified. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe and comment.